Hey, look at that. Okay, hey. Calling Chris Anderson. Where? <laughs> Where? Uh, you're, I, you're, you're in a suit yeah. or you're in a jacket and tie, so you're on the road yeah. someplace. Dis uh, undisclosed location. This, this secret undisclosed location is uh, Newbury. So we've uh, started another band of brothers tour, so I'm in Newbury, England. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Many more Nova tells of my future, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. Brought to where are you, where are you by the well, way? Well, you didn't Rick? ask. I kind of well, paused. I gave a little pause out. there. You didn't. Rick, where are you calling? Calling Rick Byer. In... Calling Rick Byer in. in. In Chicago. All right. Chicago. What's the, okay, what's home, the weather home, like home. in Chicago? Uh, okay, welcome everybody <laughs> to History Happy Hour. Brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a wide variety of tours in Europe, the uh, U.S., and Asia. Uh, you can check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. Chris, maybe we should get um, some of the hotel chains that you're spending a lot of time in to also be also kind of co-sponsors of the show. I, I, I kind of feel like the Novotel is. I mean, the Novotel, I, Mercure. Maybe we can just yeah. alternate each week. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, guys, whether you're watching live, whether you're watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast, uh, thank you for joining us. And today we're going to be talking about resistance in World War II. But for right now, let us know that you're here. And if you got a drink, what are you drinking? And Chris, is there anybody out there that we know? Yeah, well, Doreen has joined us and uh, Brian Peacock from Pennsylvania. Lizzie Borden from London. Always good to see, oh, I uh, see. Lizzie. Uh, Susan Hughes. Yeah, Doug McCord. Um, and Ron and Ross and all sorts of other people. Frank, well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we want to thank everybody who joins us, and we want to thank everybody who helps uh, support us uh, via Patreon, especially our top shelf patrons. Yes, special, special thanks. Yeah, to everybody, because uh, that's really what helps us. Uh, it's what helps us pay Cheryl. It's what helps us keep the history tabs open uh, and make this show go on. So please, uh, if you're so inclined, go to patreon.com slash history happy hour and, uh, and join that pirate crew and, and help support what we're doing. Um, Chris, do, we, do you think we have we reached a reasonable speed think, here where we can kind of launch into orbit? Well, the audience is greater than you or I, so I would say so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, give me a cue and we'll get started. is open the bar is open so chris what is what do we have on tap today yeah well i'm i'm really excited about uh, our guest uh, this week our, our guest is hella kachansky uh and she i'm a bit of a fanboy uh she's the author of one of my favorite books the eagle unbound about poland and the poles in the second world war which i use every year when i get ready for my poem trip so when she came out with her new book I was very excited and I was even more excited when she agreed to join us on the show to talk about resistance, the underground war in Europe, which has been getting rave reviews uh, in the UK and in the US, uh, and is a really wonderful uh, and very thorough account of the resistance in World War II. So, Alec, welcome. welcome. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank History you happy hour. So, you yeah. said you, you don't have a cocktail today, but you have coffee with you. So, that's. Yes. That's okay. And Chris, you've got a cocktail. I do. I have, I have a Stella. All right. Well, Stella's not really real beer. I know, but, you know, I'm in a hotel in Newbury, so okay. can I have this slack? Well, you can, you can get us started with the question. All right. All right. Jeez. Okay. So it's a wonderful book, and it's a really big subject. And one of the things um, that impressed me so much when I read it was just kind of the breadth of it and how big the topic is. So, Halleck, maybe you could start by just kind of describing what caused you to decide to to approach the topic of resistance and, and how do you decide on the parameters that you were going to use? Because it's not just about the French resistance or just about the SOE. This is a big topic. Uh, I mean, th th that last point is quite true because whenever I used to tell anyone that I was writing about resistance, they immediately assumed I was writing about the French resistance or right. if I was talking to the Poles about the Polish resistance. I mean, you sort of mentioned other countries like Belgium, Greece, Italy, those sort of blank looks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, why, why I became interested in it was came out of the Iguan Bald, that because Poland was in such a, um, 
had such a harsh occupation, they had to resist. And right. even the Germans admitted that they did so from the first day till the last day. So I wanted to, to compare the Polish story to the rest of Europe. Okay. And, and then really I decided, rather than do it country by country, which is the traditional approach, to, approach, to do it chronologically. And that was inspired by a meeting by, with a former Dutch resistor <clears throat> who told me, you know, I asked him, what did you do? And he said, I taught people how to fire Sten guns. I said, when did you get the Sten guns? 1943. But he had joined the resistance in 1941. So I was curious to know what he'd been doing beforehand, mm. because everyone thinks of resistance as armed resistance. And I'm talking about a much wider, so passive resistance, right. unarmed resistance is just as, par as powerful as armed resistance. That only really happened at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So, um, Hal, like one of the, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you go in a chronological order, as you said, uh, based on that, as opposed to going country by country. Uh, and you start at the beginning with the German offensives that often captured countries in days or weeks. And so did resistance begin right away or did it take it a while to develop? Well, um, there are two things that, that really determine how fast the resistance developed. One was what sort of German occupation there was. And the second one was past experience. And the Poles had both. They had a long revolutionary tradition of two uprisings in the 19th century against the Russians. Um, so they knew how to operate in a clandestine manner already. Um, and the country was split in half, effectively, between the Soviet Union and Germany, and then part of the German part annexed into the Reich. So it was so traumatic that this total loss of government, loss of civil service, um, closing of the universities and secondary schools, then total enslavement of the population, that they had to resist. Um, if you look in Western Europe, the Belgians had been occupied during the First World War, and so they dusted off the old plans for the intelligence networks and started them again. But France had no experience of resistance. Countries like Norway and Holland hadn't even been invaded for a long time. So their whole experience of war shocked them to the core. And you know, as they admitted at the time, there was a deep depression, the, the sheer shock of defeat. Right. So, which, which which would sort of slow the slow the development of, of resistance and that, and the kind of literally not not sort of having a playbook, not knowing how to go about it. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, armies operate on manuals. There's no manual to say this is how you form a resistance group. This is what you can do. In in Western Europe, there was also the question of why resist, because the Allied performance had been so miserably poor that it seemed that the German occupation was going to be a permanent one. And so therefore, the more sensible people, in a way, decided they might as well collaborate or at least tolerate it, accommodate it in some way. And it was only the minority who found it totally unacceptable. So, but you get into it again, I think this is a fascinating point to bring out, but you talk about kind of levels of resistance. So without sounding flip what is resistance is resistance just blowing up trains is it helping airmen escape or what i mean what what well, constitutes I, I, resistance i take it in the wide sense of the word so is anything that hampers or harasses the enemy in any way stops him ca carrying out his aims or his occupation peacefully um, so, you know, it can be a go slow in factories. I mean, this, this was one very common early form was, you know, most factories were producing stuff for the Germans to so work badly, work slowly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, one of the things that you make clear, you know, resistance, at least in most of these countries, is a choice. And you, uh, uh, you quote a Dutch resistor, uh, Eric Hazelhoff, who said, in the life of every person, there are moments when he says to himself, ah, this just won't do. And yeah. then he does something. 
So what actions by the Germans generated resistance against them and how was that different in different countries? Um, well, in Poland, the total enslavement of the country meant that, first of all, they had to produce a sort of underground state. So they they created, in fact, a, a government um, a non, uh, that was a government in waiting with a civil ser with ministries corresponding to the former ministries to direct people how to behave, and that could be through the underground press. Um, it, it was. Um, telling people just, just what their attitude to the Germans would be, that it's not permanent and you must stay strong and true to your country. Um, the, the early, it was a clandestine press, also the early escape lines for, first of all, Allied soldiers and then throughout the war, Allied air crew, um, made an important contribution in that it's told the Allies there are people resisting and they are worth helping and also gathering intelligence. I mean, that began right from the start because no one knew what Hitler was going to do next. They could guess he was going to plan to invade Britain, but only the intelligence and not the photo intelligence could give an idea of when. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to, I want to be careful because each country has, has its own story. Um, and the circumstances are different from country to country. Um, but are are there any commonalities in, in how these resistance movements get going? Because obviously, you know, there isn't a, you know, resistance organization before the war and these countries get occupied and they have to organize themselves and, and begin a campaign. So are there any kind of steps in that process uh, that they share? It is really people sounding each other out. You know, how do they feel about um, the occupation? Do they want to do something? Or even by accident, you know, knock on the door saying, do you happen to have some spare men's clothes? And then you realize, oh, actually, could you hide this person overnight? Could you hide these papers? Um, could you carry, you're traveling to this town. Could you take something, drop off a message for someone? Uh, they, they often fall into it without realizing they're actually part of the resistance. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us, <clears throat> when we look at people in the resistance, say, you know, oh, would I be willing to take th those kind of chances that, you know, Marie, Madeleine Forcade or other people took? Would I have been willing to confront the Nazis, you know, knowing that yeah. that might lead to, to a painful death? Um, and you have a, a quote from another resistor uh, named Jean Cassou in Toulouse who remembered this as, quote, a unique period, impossible to relate or to explain, almost a dream. We see an unknown and unknowable version of ourselves, the kind of people no one can ever find again. And it's a really kind of fascinating thought. And I mean, clearly, he is grappling with sort of understanding this question, too, of why people were willing to do this. So are these extraordinary people um, or are they ordinary people res responding to the most extraordinary of circumstances? I, th I think the last thing, that they are ordinary people responding to the circumstances. And, you know, the leadership would come you know, not from the top because you have to remember that most of the officers were prisoners of war in most countries. So the leadership had to come from you know, other people who would never have seen themselves before as leaders. And, you know, contacting useful people, often meeting people that they wouldn't normally meet um, in everyday life and working together. I mean, it, it was really bringing people across the class barriers, um, across different work spheres. So you... You also talk about that one of the first, so you've got these extraordinary people and something causes them to say enough is enough or I can't stand this and I'm going to fight it back. But you say that one of the first battles they have to face is to, to get the population on their side to convince them that this is the right thing to do. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is that a hard thing to do? Is it a hard sell? It, it was very important because the first acts of armed resistance led to a great response from the Germans. 
Um, already in Poland, the death of two Germans in December 1939 led to the death of 100 Poles. Um, sabotage in the Czech factories led to literal decimation, the execution of every 10th worker, regardless of whether he was guilty of sabotage or not. So people were very, very frightened mm -hmm. of resistance. Um, in, in Holland, um, you know, the, the local mayors who, they weren't Nazis at that stage, were just saying, look, we want to keep law and order. As long as we keep things quiet, the Germans won't do too much to us. So the underground press developed to tell people really what the occupation meant. Like, we are short of food, not because of the, what the Germans say is it's because of the British blockade. You're short of food because the Germans are taking it all. Mm -hmm. um, they would tell the truth. Um, they would also discuss you know, the past and the future. Because you have to remember that the war came immediately after the Great Depression. Right. So people were actually pretty traumatized by both events and just thinking, well, what sort of form of government should we have afterwards? And so these discussions took place in the, in the underground press. Um, and, and it was really to tell people, you know, yes, the Allies will take a long time to get going, but Britain won the Battle of Britain. And once the Americans and the Soviets come in, it's going to be a long war, but they will win. This is not yeah. going to be a permanent German occupation. So, so is the underground press kind of an instigator of resistance? And to what degree is it just developing spontaneously? And to what degree is it is it egged on or helped on by the British, by the Americans, by the Russians the, or the whatever? The British and Americans never had anything to do with it. Um, they never controlled the data. They did you know, with the broadcast on the BBC into the occupied countries which were important, but they never interfered with the press. No, I mean, the press, was, you know, some early issues were done on a child's printing press, uh, because finding the right paper and the right ink were, was the most, and typeface and machinery was the, was the most challenging thing. And it was the idea that you would give a friend a copy, he would copy it out six times, pass it to six friends and so on it would carry on like that and you know some of them spiraled into uh you know over a hundred thousand um copies mm. once they could get hold of the machinery um, and, and you know it became quite a military operation and it was also an <laughs> ideal training ground for resistors you know could, would they take the risk of taking a bundle of papers and distributing them mm. could they keep the secret um or not if they were caught could they bluff their way out of trouble um so, so, so you know it, it served in many ways it also just told people resist, the resistance exists and i think um, henry Frenney said about um combat they might not remember the name of the movement but they will remember the newspaper yeah. Mm. Well, kind of picking up on that hella could you talk you, you, in the book you talk about the battle of the mind what do you mean by that? What, what is well, that? Well, well, that? That is, in, you know, in more military terms, you'll be talking about morale. Okay. You know, we're, we're talking about this great sense of depression immediately after the defeats. And so you have to start looking at the positives and just convince people this is not going to be a permanent state of affairs. Don't collaborate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, identify the collaborators, but don't take part yourself. Because mo very few resisted, very few collaborated. Most people were just waiting to see what would happen. Right. And were basically mostly concerned about putting food um, yeah. on the table for their families. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find, as you looked at this topic, Halleck, uh, you know, uh, first of all, can you give us a sense of what percentage of people, it might be a guess, took part in the resistance? And was there anything that that differentiated them? As you've looked at this, you spent seven years writing this book. Mm -hmm. Anything that, that stood out to you that said, well, these people who were in the resistance, they all had this X quality and that the other people didn't have. So can you give us a, a sense of that? 
No, I don't. You know, the resistors themselves resi really got offended by attempts to categorize them. You know, when asked why they did it, they just sort of had to do something, or how could one not do something? They really are very, very unhelpful in why they did it. Some people thrived on the sense of danger. Other people were totally intimidated by it. You know, there's, there's no way you can actually ca categorize them. I mean, certainly there have been useful local studies looking at who did within a certain area. But the trouble is because I, I was looking across Europe, these are very patchy studies. And particularly with Eastern Europe, the uh, history of the resistance there was very politicized after the war. And they were only allowed to talk about the communist resistance that was really very small. I mean, as, as to what percentage of the population were active resistors until, well, let's say until 1942, it would be well under 10%. Yeah. Can I can I just jump in with a follow there, Chris? Yeah, of course. Because because Hal, like I wanted to uh, uh, mention that, that I I had interviewed a um, someone in uh, in Norway many years ago who was involved uh, when the Germans invaded Norway. He was involved in smuggling out the gold that was in Norway uh, for the German for the for the Norwegian royal family, and uh, and then I interviewed his daughter. Uh, uh, and she, she who was a who was a, a Norwegian um, a soap opera star, and uh, she said that um, she hadn't known anything about what her father did until they started talking about it in school one day when she was in fifth grade, and and uh, and they're talking about the gold and they're under fire and all this stuff is going on. She confronts her father and says, "Well, well, did you do all this stuff, uh, you know, that they talked about in school with this gold thing?" And he said, "Well, yes, I did." And she said, "Well, why didn't you ever say anything about it?" And he said, "Well, I just did what any Norwegian would do." <laughs> so, so that kind of rung the bell when you were talking about, you know, sort of resisting collab, uh, you know, kind of a categorization, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of the resistors that they they probably feel that they are they are doing what everybody would do if. If they were moved the same way that the resistor is moved, but, but you know, people had to be careful not to make assumptions because I do use one example of someone in a Dutch frater student fraternity who assumed that everyone felt as indignant by the German their defeat and the occupation as he did, and he found that actually most people were prepared to wait and see. A few were going to try and get to England. Some wanted to do something, some activity. They didn't know what. And one was later seen in the uniform of a Dutch SS. Mm. Mm. And that's See. just one student fraternity. Yeah. So, you know, um, you couldn't tell who was going to do what. Like, you couldn't tell who would crack um, when caught either. Yeah. You know, some would withstand terrible torture and some would just become gibbering wrecks and couldn't stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, yeah. that would be that would be. <laughs> you don't know. The problem is you don't know. Even people who are trained to withstand interrogation actually mm. don't know. You know, if we jump ahead to 1943 when the Germans really attacked the resistance, it was kindness that actually led to disaster in France, by because they saw some SOE officers being treated well, and they think, well, why should I be tortured? Right. Hmm. Um, if I could be looked after or, you know, cared for, you know, some had had very poor treatment before they actually got into German hands. Right. Well, can you talk, I mean, one of the other things that, that struck me as I, I read about some of these people is just how unprepared they are for this. I mean, you know, it's not like they went to spy school before the war started, so they were ready to pick up arms when the Germans came. I mean, talk a little bit about some of the backgrounds of these people and maybe how do you become a resistor or, or more importantly, an effective resistor, right? How do... Well, I mean, people were, were much more in, in smaller communities then. So they knew all the people in their village or, you know, university fraternities, um, factories. They were close knit in that way. So they could sound out people. Um, they hadn't generally hadn't travelled much then. Um, of course, there was some military experience from the First World War, 
and also from compulsory military service. So a number knew already knew how to shoot, and hunting was, uh, you know, a great rural sport. So if they managed to hide the weapons uh, from the Germans, they already had something there. Um, but you know, the, the it was in the towns developed the underground press, obviously, um, with presses hidden, for instance, in the basement of the Sorbonne. Um, <laughs> or in a dog kennel pound in one place, covered up the noise of it. Mm. Um, you know, you, you can't tell how they, how they will develop. Women, of course, played a very important role because a lot of the men were either way as prisoners of war or they had to prove why they were at liberty. They had to have some certificate of discharge, mm. they had to have a certificate of employment. They, they had to explain why they were living where they were living. Um, women ha were much freer to move around. You know, particularly when forced labor came in, men were, were very vulnerable to being stopped um, for that. But, but women could act as couriers. And of course, theirs was an extremely dangerous job because whereas instinctively they, they realized, the, the resistors realized they needed to um, operate in small cells so they knew as few people as possible. The couriers had to take messages from one cell to another so they knew more people. And so when they were caught and that, they were really targeted by the Germans, um, they could reveal more. But in fact, they, they were often pretty good at standing up to interrogation. Yeah, what I, you know, I, again, I think it's really interesting and I I'd maybe expand a bit more on it, but women tend to play an even bigger role you know, so you, you, for some of the reasons that you talked about um, than I think people maybe give them credit for. Um, does it does it kind of advance? I mean, do they have any sense that, that they're special or that, that this is kind of a game changer that now that we can get involved in a way that we couldn't before? Or is, um, no, I, think, I, th I think they were empowered by it. Yeah. Um, but because they were they were taking a lot of, of risks, um, you know, for intelligence can be a piece of paper can be swallowed. Newspapers and other papers can be hidden or thrown away. But how do you hide an allied airman? Right. It's usually the women who were moving them. Um, so, you know, and, and did get caught doing that as yeah. well. Um, they, you know, they, they they took advantage of it, and I think they they, they certainly were empowered by it. Because you have to remember, in France before the war, the women did not have the vote in right. the general elections. They got it after the war. Um, in Italy, it was also the same. They only got the vote after the war, um, and they became much more politicized and and you know, much more powerful because you know they had to feed their families. Their men were away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the opposite of resistance is collaboration. Um, and so resistance isn't only against the Germans, it's against the collaborators, which means it's against, you know, sort of your fellow countrymen, maybe your, your family or friends or people that you know. So how, how did that play out in different countries? Well, again, collaboration was not, uh, was equally a minority activity. Um, it was encouraged in some countries. I mean, Pétain in the south of France wanted collaboration with Germany. Um, Hacher in the Czech protectorate encouraged collaboration. Um, they hoped to act as a shield um, against the more starkest German um, treatment of the, of the people. Um, and that manifestly failed when forced labor came in. So then people were much more polarized towards resistance um, against the German policies or collaboration with them. Because you have to remember the, the um, things like forced labor and indeed rounding up the Jews was done by the native civil service and police. It wasn't, it wasn't the German soldiers putting them on the trains. Yeah. Um, but yes, they, they were, because they lived within the community, the resistors could identify them. And it, it, sometimes in certain areas, you know, as highlighted in one part of Belgium, there, there was a little civil war going on in the town. It was 
you know, a collaborator got shot, so a resistor got shot, and so on. Usually, until the Germans just said enough, <laughs> enough. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, just just stop it. Um, but also against collaborating regimes, I think the most effect effective unarmed resistance was in Norway, um, where Quisling the sort of wanted to Nazify the country, and the Norwegians united in resistance. So you know, tried to um, Nazify the legal sy system, the Supreme Court resigned, the church or the deacons resigned, um, the trade unions, they all went underground. The education system led to over 100,000 letters from parents arriving in the ministry in the same two days in protest. Mm. So in the end, the Germans just said, look, stop it. And Quisling chided the resistance, it spoils everything for me. It was a huge <laughs> they just didn't cooperate. They didn't want yeah. to you know, play ball. So uh, one of the things that, again, I know obviously the focus is on the movements and the people in the movements, but what is the germ the German reaction to this? I mean, one question is, do they really think that they're going to be able to just control all of Europe and these people are going to be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And well, then that, they could do, you know, for, for much of the war, there was the East-West divide and that was brought out by German behavior. German right. behavior in the East was you are our slaves. Right. Uh, and if you kill a German, we will kill 50 of you in reprisal. Mm. Now, in Western Europe, they all they wanted to do was exploit the economic resources of the country. Right. So as long as nothing was done against them, they wouldn't retaliate. But in the autumn 1941, the first German soldier actually gets assassinated in France, followed by a few others. So the reaction again is we should shoot 50 <clears throat> Frenchmen. No, said the German commanders in France, pleaded with Berlin, we don't have to, we can control the situation. Right. Right. It was only in 1942 with, the, with forced labour when young men were given the choice, effectively, you have to go and work for the Germans in Germany. Um, that but suddenly the resistance looks good. <sighs> well, well, they fled to the forest and that actually forced the resistance to become more organised because... They had to feed and shelter these people. Yeah. Not all of them were then going to become armed fighters, but they had to be helped. Um, mm. and, and it showed there was an alternative. And it also demonstrated the futility of Patin's thing of, you know, we are a shield against German policies, because they were actually, the Vichy regime was actually carrying them out. Right. And, and how do the Germans, I mean, again, I, I, I know this is a generality. I don't mean it to be because it's it's much broader. But uh, did the Germans see the, these this resistance as just kind of an annoyance, uh, or or is it a threat that has to be squashed? And is it if so, when does that happen? Or first they're just like, okay, just kind of keep a lid on it and it'll blow over. How does that change? Well, it, it can vary from from different areas. Um, most of the time, it was just a nuisance. Right. Um, but in the summer of 1943, we've already had the German defeat at Stalingrad. Everything's geared up for the great battle of Kursk, yeah. the sort of deciding battle on the Eastern Front. And so there's a sort of concerted effort by the Germans to crush the resistance in Europe. In other words, in their rear line, you know, behind the lines mm. and you know they, they take out northern France with the collapse of the Prosper line uh, the Bordeaux region through um, André Clomont Grand, Grand Clomont um, southeastern France through another lot of careless arrests of SOE agents yeah. um, Poland they, they capture the head of the home army um, and so, you know, people tend to see resistance as a linear process increasing as the war went yeah. on. There was a huge crash then. I mean, they were the Germans were also controlling the Dutch resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and yet, you know, I think one thing that I most admire about the resistance is the resilience. Yeah. They can go through all these 
widespread arrest, collapse of network after network after network, you don't know who to trust anymore. And yet new leaders will emerge. And a mm. year later, they were ready to help the allies after D-Day and in the East after Operation Bagration. Mm. So uh, bring in a question from one of our viewers, uh, Frank Cook. Uh, uh, was there any one country where the resistance was at a greater level when compared with other European countries? And maybe that's that's Poland that you've talked about a little bit, but I'll leave it to you to answer it. And similarly, which country had the lowest level of resistance? Um, you know, maybe you don't want to go out there on that limb, but maybe you can, can give us a sense of, of, of kind of the two extremes of that question. Right. Well, the, the, I think the resistance movement that had the greatest potential was the Polish Home Army. Um, had it received enough weapons, then it could have achieved a lot more than it did. But it, it held the country together in the cause of resistance. Um, the Yugoslavs like to think they were very active, but certainly they controlled a lot of territory. But in fact, the vital cities and industries remained in German hands right until the Germans had to retreat. Um, levels of resistance varied from time, over, over time. Um, because obviously there was no point in resisting too much and just getting crushed all the time. Um, so you would probably say that, that in Holland and Belgium, um, Denmark and Tilburg was 43, um, and, and a lot of France, where actually they didn't see the point in resistance until, again, it was the Germans who really created the resistance through the forced labor decrees mm. that did gave the, the essence of manpower and the reason to resist. Did, did the Germans, I mean, sometimes you, you, you're looking at the, the Nazis, you're looking at the Germans, and they, they seem to engage in policies which are enormously self-destructive. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they literally create a resistance by the harshness of their policies. Were, were there people in the, in the German power structure who were, which obviously is, you know, invest a lot of power in Hitler and less uh, as you go down, who, who were saying, well, well, wait a minute, maybe we should try something a little different so that, so that we don't create this big response to us? Or, or were those voices just shouted down from the beginning? Well, the interesting case is the occupied Soviet Union, because the areas that the Germans occupied, um, particularly the Ukraine, had had a man-made or Stalin-inspired famine. So the loyalty to the communist regime was not that high. The Germans could have reversed collectivization. That was one thing that would have given them enormous support um, had they done that. Um, but they didn't chose not to because it was easier for them to exploit agriculture. Um, and also the Ukrainians welcomed them, um, as did the Belarusians, welcomed them as not being communists. Um, it wasn't particularly that they were Germans, but um, they were hoping for independence from the Germans. And when they didn't get it, then you know the country split into resistance. But the Germans could have ruled those areas much more peacefully than they actually did. Um, of course, resistance would have developed further on, but because of the ruthless exploitation, it was taking all the food away, but because the, but this was the time of the sort of German hunger plan, that they wanted to, the Germans were going to colonize the area, so it was best if the population died out through overwork and mm. lack of food. And it was uh, absolutely ruthless. But it didn't need to be. Western Europe still wasn't. Yeah. So, so how, I mean, I, I did a, a fair amount of digging around on the SOE for some projects that I had been working on. And, and sometimes you get the impression that, um, you know, the good folks uh, in Baker Street in London, they had this master plan and they're going to, you know, direct direct the actions of the resistance and lead the war effort from Baker Street. Um, how much control of these movements is directed by the allies, say in London or Washington or Moscow, and how much of it is, um, it's just internal to the countries that are occupied. I mean, who's who's commanding the resistance, if you could even say that? 
Ah, well, well, I mean, that, that is a very interesting question because the resistance movements developed out of the countries. But of course, in order to do anything in the way of armed resistance, they needed weapons. And this is where SOE came in, that they could supply the weapons. And it was th through the weapon supply that the Allies hoped to control the resistance. And you know, you had that the situation in both Yugoslavia and Greece, and to a certain extent in Albania, that civil war, actually two resistance groups, the communists and the non-communists, fighting each other, probably more than fighting the Germans. Mm -hmm. And so the Allies would withhold the weapons supplies until they stopped doing that. That, that worked until September 43, when the Italians surrendered and suddenly the Balkans was awash with Italian weaponry. After that, really, SOE had n no useful role to pay, play in the area. And in fact, may have made the a bad situation even worse. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the resistance would obey allied orders, even if their orders didn't make sense. And in fact, there were a lot of complaints that the orders didn't make sense. Like it, uh, the Allies did not understand the resistance. Um, in June 1944, because there was the Normandy beachhead was going to be very vulnerable, they called out the resistance throughout France. And they obligingly came out into the open, only to be told a few days later, no, no, this is premature, go back home. <laughs> well, you can't go back home. Right. You can't. You come out into the open, so even those collaborators will know that who you are and where you are. Yeah. Um, the same in the winter of 44 to 5, when General Alexander realised the Allies would not break into, through into the Po Plain that, before winter. Um, he just you know, said to the resistance, stand down over the winter. <laughs> Go home, come back. Yeah. Yeah. And they can't do that. Um, so, you know, it was pretty infuriating. In Greece, they were told to hamper the German retreat because obviously the Germans were going to be passing through critical rail junctions and could then be turned towards Italy or to hamper the Soviet advance. Well, when you've been occupied and brutally occupied with you, whole villages and the populations massacred, you're not going to harass them so they turn around and hit you again. All right, let them go. On the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get, get out of here. Uh, uh, bringing up another question from a, a viewer here, uh, Catherine Byer Hurst asks, is there a difference between the resistance movement as a whole versus the Jewish resistance going on during the war? OK, well, how I've tackled the subject is that Jews actually formed um, were numerically more present in the resistance movements compared to the percentage of their population. But they were fighting as Frenchmen, as Belgians, as Dutch for the most part. So how I approached the question was resisting the Holocaust. Um, and the Jewish resistance there, you know, the uprisings in the ghetto, um, the attempts to stop deportation trains. Um, there you see the tragedy of the timeline because the outside resistance, you know, non-Jewish resistance could choose the moment of their, their most activity to time with when the allies were approaching, um, which as it turned out was 1944. The height of the Holocaust was summer 42. That's two years well, um, and so they were largely alone, also because they had no foreign country sponsoring them, like weapons being flown in for, from Britain. They were reliant on what anyone else gave them. Um, so, and the, and the last point is the moral dimension of resistance, which actually affects everyone, that you as an individual can decide, you know, I will undertake this action, I will pay the price if I get caught. But what happens starts happening a lot more, particularly with the communists get act, um, active, is that it's total strangers who get wiped out because the perpetrator has scarpered, um, and they would just destroy the Germans would just destroy the village. Now you take the ghettos of Eastern Europe; that's a captive population, and you read those debates on, um, you know, should they resist or not. That is absolutely traumatic stuff. 
you know, because if they resist, they could um, they ran the risk of uh, the premature um, eradication of the ghetto. If they didn't, then they were lambs willingly going to, going to the slaughter. I mean, as I quote one mm. resistor, they're saying they're fighting for three lines in the history book. Well, I've given them two pretty long chapters. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, we're going to ask another another questions come in from one of the guests, uh, and we're going to post that. This is from uh, Jim Stark. This is was there any place that the resistance was particularly effective, and conversely, anywhere where it was less than effective? And I would add on to that, kind of bigger picture: was the resistance effective militarily, or is it effective and important for other reasons? Well, I've, already, I've already brought up the Norwegian um, right. example of, of them totally stopping the Nazification. From the armed resistance point of view, probably it was what you were telling me you're looking into Operation Torch, mm -hmm. that um, they had time to prepare um, ahead of things. So, I mean, um, Henri Zeller, who's the sort of French head of the um, secret army, and flew to Algiers to consult um, the French high command there, and he said, well, I can guarantee that I will blow up every single bridge in the south of France. And he was, oh, no, please don't, said his brother, who's the chief engineer of the French army, because I shall only have to rebuild it. <laughs> but what, what they did more seriously say to the Americans is, you will be able to reach Grenoble within 10 days. And of course, the, the American plans at that stage were, was for much more cautious advance, and they made it. Yeah, yeah. And that was partly because they, they had the resistance acting as their infantry and they could concentrate on going very fast. Uh, where the intelligence, where resistance was particularly effective was intelligence um, with, with the knowledge of the V weapons. Um, and, you know, air reconnaissance could spot these strange, um, you know, they had to be told, air reconnaissance had to be told what to look for. And the resistance on the ground could do that, and also find out how these weapons worked hmm. as well. Um, least effective, I mean, there's the tragedy of the uprisings. And this is really where, when they tried to do too much in Warsaw. Um, Paris was only saved by the fact that um, a lot of political pressure meant that Patton had to turn, send some troops south to Paris because they hadn't been going, intending to go to Paris. Um, but the tragedy of Warsaw and Slovakia was that the Soviets sort of thought, well, fine, we'll let the Germans massacre you. Um, that will save us having to do the job later because we can't control you. You're not on our side. Um, so, so that was a great tragedy. But on the other hand, the uprisings tended to work in Italy, where they did liberate the northern towns northern cities before the allies got there and that was really because they, they, it wasn't just resisting the germans it was resisting the prospect of an allied um, military government they wanted to say nope we've got everything up and running again we don't yeah. need your help yeah so um you know one of the one of the things that happens in the course of the resistance is that um you know you've, you've got armed people opposing the nazis but after a while uh you, you also start to get civil war in some countries where you get resistance movements fighting against each other so where where is that most pronounced and and why does that take place well it was most pronounced in the balkans and that that's really is because um the i mean i usually call it democratic resistance where it was looking to restore the pre-war regimes um, well, certainly pre-war regime in Yugoslavia, um, they were loyal to the king, um, whereas T Tito and the partisans wanted to create a communist state. In Greece, it was more complicated because the king had gone into exile and the British desperately looked for a royalist resistance, didn't really find it, and had to work with two republican movements, one which was communist and one which was not. Um, so, so that added a, an extra uh, level of complexity to it. Um, and towards the end of the war, 
Um, it was quite clear. I mean, in Yugoslavia, the British had just said, look, we, we can only support one movement. Um, the reports we've got, and I do go into why the reports were not accurate, suggest that the partisans are the ones we should support. They give them weapons. There's a total failure of command and control. Um, and Tito, um, instead of stopping um, or hampering the German retreat uh, from Albania and Greece through Yugoslavia, says, no, we, we're turning east. We're going to crush Serbia so that we greet the Soviets uh, when they arrive. Um, in Greece, of course, the civil war, you get uh, round one during the war that the Allies hold back the, the weapons and that stops it. Round two is uh, Christmas 1944, when the communists very nearly take over the country. Um, I mean, the, the British bridgehead was becoming smaller and smaller um, and there was great danger. It was only really because Stalin showed very little interest in Greece. He, he decided that Greece was part of the British sphere of interest and they, they were not going to be supported because they, after the war, there was a much longer, much more vicious civil war then. Um, but it was, it was people looking to set up a brave new world in the midst of a world war. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, picking up on that, um, one of the things that I kind of like to get your thoughts on, obviously the, the, the war, the occupation of the countries, these resistance movement, it, it unleashes all sorts of forces. The world's totally changed. How do, how do these resistance movements impact the countries going forward? The idea that there had been a resistance, how does it change the countries that had been occupied? Or, you know, what comes out at the end? Well, some countries just return to normal, like Norway and Holland return to Norway, to, to normal. In Denmark, they were very clever. They, the first post-war cabinet had half the members were from the Resistance Freedom Council and half were pre-war politicians. So that was a due acknowledgement of the resistance. And this is what these people wanted, was acknowledgement. Um, France was much more sort of complicated because de Gaulle had to rush around the country in September 44 and say, France liberated itself. Yeah. In fact, there were still millions of allies, uh, allies <laughs> <laughs> French indeed still fighting in, uh, on French territory. Um, when he was doing that, he kicked out the SOE agents yeah. that we don't want you anymore. Um, it turned against the communists and just really worked very fast to do that. And the resistance were not consulted. They weren't even acknowledged. They weren't invited to the Paris Victory March in August uh, when de Gaulle first came to Paris. You know, it was, what's it to do with them? Same in Greece. You know, what's it to do with the resistance? Mm -hmm. And they felt cheated. Italy, they learned a lot of lessons, so they let them have very formal marches. Um, celebratory victory marches and then go off and be demobilized. Um, in Belgium, they handled the situation very clumsily because the king had made himself very unpopular during the war. And in fact, SOE had to rush over a lot of Sten guns to arm the Belgian police <laughs> in case the communists who were refusing to disarm would do something. But that was partly the frustration of the Belgian resistance. The Allied advance had just swept across Belgium and the only thing that the only achievement of the Belgian resistance was to save the port of Antwerp. And that was thrown that uh, was thrown away because the Allies forgot about taking the importance of taking the Shell test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, enable the port to be used. Yeah. So uh, kind of the, the, the twin question to Chris's question is uh, how do you think the resistance movements impacted the outcome of the war? Um, how would things have been different if the resistance simply hadn't materialized the way it did? Um, now th this is very, very di difficult to tell because, you know, the resistance, it is a shared in the victory in Western Europe. There was a restoration of liberal democracy. They were, they were the victors in Eastern Europe. Um, because the communists took over and imprisoned the, the resistance fighters. Um, it was a total defeat. So that there were, again, you, so you go back to the East-West divide there. Um, how much it, it changed I, I, is very difficult to tell because I don't obviously don't go on beyond 1945. So I don't know enough about post-war politics. 
um, to, to see their impact. Um, but th th there was a lot of caution in, for instance, in Italy, um, they realized that if they tried to imprison every single fascist, then they would have hardly anyone to run the country. Um, so so they, you know, the certain post-war trials had to take place of the lead of the leading collaborators. Um, but a lot of people were sort of told, well, okay, you collaborated because you had to. Um, you know, it was starvation or collaboration. We're not going to punish you. Um, or we might remove your civil rights, which means you can't vote in elections for a certain period of time. Um, they tried to control it because you did in France have this wild time when people were just executing each other. And of course, you know, it comes down to the way betrayals happened during the war. A lot of it's just personal slight. You know, you don't like your neighbor, you fancy your neighbor's fields and you say you betray, um, you, you just say, well, I'm, not, I'm sure you must have collaborated, execute. It was totally wild justice. And they mm. said this had to be brought out under control. Um, but with post-war politics, people will say, oh, it, it led towards the European Union or it led towards greater cooperation. Um, it's a very dangerous ground to go on because you can you, you can point it out both ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, most of the people who'd come out of the shadows and done these tremendous things actually returned to the shadows. You know, I, I, I made a lengthy list of the main names of the people in my book and looked at the post-war careers. Very few of them were who went into politics. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, well, uh, Halak Kochinski, thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour to talk about your book, Resistance, The uh, Underground War Against Hitler, 1939 to 1945. It is, it is long. It is complete. It is uh, uh, a terrific effort, and we so appreciate you coming on here today to join us to talk about it. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Yes, make sure you read this book, guys, and when you're done with that, read The Eagle Unbowed, because that's really good, too. There you thank go. You. So you got two books two books for one on this one. That's right. Uh, Halleck, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Halleck. And uh, so, Chris, next week, uh, uh, we have, uh, we're, we're going back to an encore episode, um, because I will be speaking at the time of our show in, oh. in, uh, in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, Pardon so, me. Yeah, I, enjoy so, I know. I'll try to enjoy Michigan. Uh, but we're going to have on uh, the show we did with John Foote, who's the author of the book Blood and Power, which is the story of fascism's rise and fall. It's a jolly, you know, lighthearted tale. Of <laughs> <laughs> we have some resistance in there, though. Mayhem uh, in Italy. No, it's quite an interesting interview and an interesting book. And uh, um, you know, I think the I think Italy deserves the attention. It's a very, very interesting story of what happens there. Absolutely. Uh, guys, please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, shout at us on Twitter, listen to our podcast, and back us on Patreon and browse. What's our website, Chris? Historyhappyhour dot com. Oh, that's right. We are talking, I guess. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.